Chapter 39 The Conquest of Bashan This chapter is based on Deuteronomy 2 and chapter 3, 1 through 11. After passing to the south of Edom, the Israelites turned northward, and again set their faces toward the promised land. Their route now lay over a vast elevated plain, swept by cool, fresh breezes from the hills. It was a welcome change from the parched valley through which they had been traveling, and they pressed forward, buoyant and hopeful. Having crossed the brook Zered, they passed to the east of the land of Moab, for the command had been given, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given Ar unto the children of Lot. And the same direction was repeated concerning the Ammonites, who were also descendants of Lot. Still pushing northward, the hosts of Israel soon reached the country of the Amorites. This strong and warlike people originally occupied the southern part of the land of Canaan, but increasing in numbers, they crossed the Jordan, made war upon the Moabites, and gained possession of a portion of their territory. Here they had settled, holding undisputed sway over all the land from the Arnon as far north as the Jabbok. The route to the Jordan, which the Israelites desired to pursue, lay directly through this territory, and Moses sent a friendly message to Sion, the Amorite king, at his capital, Let me pass through thy land. I will go along by the highway. I will neither turn unto the right hand nor to the left. Thou shalt sell me meat for money, that I may eat, and give me water for money, that I may drink. Only I will pass through on my feet. The answer was a decided refusal, and all the hosts of the Amorites were summoned to oppose the progress of the invaders. This formidable army struck terror to the Israelites, who were poorly prepared for an encounter with well-armed and well-disciplined forces. So far as skill in warfare was concerned, their enemies had the advantage. To all human appearance, a speedy end would be made of Israel. But Moses kept his gaze fixed upon the cloudy pillar and encouraged the people with the thought that the token of God's presence was still with them. At the same time, he directed them to do all that human power could do in preparing for war. Their enemies were eager for battle, and confident that they would blot out the unprepared Israelites from the land. But, from the possessor of all lands, the mandate had gone forth to the leader of Israel, Rise ye up, take your journey, and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given into thine hand Sion, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it, and contend with him in battle. This day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, who shall hear report of thee, and shall tremble, and be in anguish because of thee. These nations on the borders of Canaan would have been spared had they not stood in defiance of God's word to oppose the progress of Israel. The Lord had shown himself to be long-suffering, of great kindness and tender pity, even to these heathen peoples. When Abraham was shown in vision that his seed, the children of Israel, should be strangers in a strange land four hundred years, the Lord gave him the promise, In the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. Although the Amorites were idolaters, whose life was justly forfeited by their great wickedness. God spared them four hundred years to give them unmistakable evidence that He was the only true God, the Maker of heaven and earth. All His wonders in bringing Israel from Egypt were known to them. Sufficient evidence was given. They might have known the truth, had they been willing to turn from their idolatry and licentiousness, but they rejected the light and clung to their idols. When the Lord brought His people a second time to the borders of Canaan, additional evidence of His power was granted to those heathen nations. They saw that God was with Israel in the victory gained over King Arad and the Canaanites, and in the miracle wrought to save those who were perishing from the sting of the serpents. 
Although the Israelites had been refused a passage through the land of Edom, thus being compelled to take the long and difficult route by the Red Sea, yet in all their journeyings and encampments, past the land of Edom, of Moab and Ammon, they had shown no hostility, and had done no injury to the people or their possessions. On reaching the border of the Amorites, Israel had asked permission only to travel directly through the country, promising to observe the same rules that had governed their intercourse with other nations. When the Amorite king refused this courteous solicitation and defiantly gathered his host for battle, their cup of iniquity was full, and God would now exercise his power for their overthrow. The Israelites crossed the river Arnon and advanced upon the foe. An engagement took place in which the armies of Israel were victorious, and following up the advantage gained, they were soon in possession of the country of the Amorites. It was a captain of the Lord's host who vanquished the enemies of his people, and he would have done the same thirty-eight years before had Israel trusted in him. Filled with hope and courage, the army of Israel eagerly pressed forward, and still journeying northward, they soon reached a country that might well test their courage and their faith in God. Before them lay the powerful and populous kingdom of Bashan, crowded with great stone cities that to this day excite the wonder of the world, threescore cities with high walls, gates, and bars, besides unwalled towns a great many. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. The houses were constructed of huge black stones of such stupendous size as to make the buildings absolutely impregnable to any force that in those times could have been brought against them. It was a country filled with wild caverns, lofty precipices, yawning gulfs, and rocky strongholds. The inhabitants of this land, descendants from a giant race, were themselves of marvelous size and strength, and so distinguished for violence and cruelty as to be the terror of all surrounding nations. While Og, the king of the country, was remarkable for size and prowess, even in a nation of giants. But the cloudy pillar moved forward, and following its guidance, the Hebrew hosts advanced to Idrii, where the giant king with his forces awaited their approach. Og had skillfully chosen the place of battle. The city of Adriae was situated upon the border of a tableland rising abruptly from the plain and covered with the jagged volcanic rocks. It could be approached only by narrow pathways, steep and difficult of ascent. In case of defeat, his forces could find refuge in that wilderness of rocks, where it would be impossible for strangers to follow them. Confident of success, the king came forth with an immense army upon the open plain, while shouts of defiance were heard from the tableland above, where might be seen the spears of thousands eager for the fray. When the Hebrews looked upon the lofty form of that giant of giants towering above the soldiers of his army, when they saw the hosts that surrounded him and beheld the seemingly impregnable fortress behind which unseen thousands were entrenched, the hearts of many in Israel quaked with fear. But Moses was calm and firm. The Lord had said, concerning the king of Bashan, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand, and thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Zion, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. The calm faith of their leader inspired the people with confidence in God. They trusted all to his omnipotent arm, and he did not fail them. Not mighty giants nor walled cities, armed hosts nor rocky fortresses could stand before the captain of the Lord's host. The Lord led the army. The Lord discomfited the enemy. The Lord conquered in behalf of Israel. The giant king and his army were destroyed, and the Israelites soon took possession of the whole country. Thus was blotted from the earth that strange people who had given themselves up to iniquity and abominable idolatry. In the conquest of Gilead and Bashan, there were many who recalled the events which nearly forty years before had, in Kadesh, doomed Israel to the long desert wanderings. 
they saw that the report of the spies concerning the promised land was in many respects correct. The cities were walled and very great, and were inhabited by giants in comparison with whom the Hebrews were mere pygmies. But they could now see that the fatal mistake of their fathers had been in distrusting the power of God. This alone had prevented them from at once entering the goodly land. When they were at the first preparing to enter Canaan, the undertaking was attended with far less difficulty than now. God had promised His people that if they would obey His voice, He would go before them and fight for them, and He would also send hornets to drive out the inhabitants of the land. The fears of the nations had not been generally aroused, and little preparation had been made to oppose their progress. But when the Lord now bade Israel go forward, they must advance against the alert and powerful foes, and must contend with large and well-trained armies that had been preparing to resist their approach. In their contest with Og and Zion, the people were brought to the same test beneath which their fathers had so signally failed. But the trial was now far more severe than when God had commanded Israel to go forward. The difficulties in their way had greatly increased since they refused to advance when bidden to do so in the name of the Lord. It is thus that God still tests His people. And if they fail to endure the trial, He brings them again to the same point, and the second time the trial will come closer and be more severe than the preceding. This is continued until they bear the test, or, if they are still rebellious, God withdraws His light from them and leaves them in darkness. The Hebrews now remembered how once before, when their forces had gone to battle, they had been routed and thousands slain. But they had then gone in direct opposition to the command of God. They had gone out without Moses, God's appointed leader, without the cloudy pillar, the symbol of the divine presence, and without the ark, but now Moses was with them, strengthening their hearts with words of hope and faith. The Son of God, enshrined in the cloudy pillar, led the way, and the sacred ark accompanied the host. This experience has a lesson for us. The mighty God of Israel is our God. In Him we may trust, and if we obey His requirements, He will work for us in as signal a manner as He did for His ancient people. Everyone who seeks to follow the path of duty will at times be assailed by doubt and unbelief. The way will sometimes be so barred by obstacles, apparently insurmountable, as to dishearten those who will yield to discouragement. But God is saying to such, Go forward. Do your duty at any cost. The difficulties that seem so formidable, that fill your soul with dread, will vanish as you move forward in the path of obedience, humbly trusting in God.